contact center has long been looked at as a cost center for a number of reasons, including things like high employee turnover rates, customer churn as a result of inefficient customer service, and of course, manual processes that waste businesses' resources, such as time and money. You'll hear me say it a number of times throughout the event, but over the past year and a half, digital transformation relating to customer experience has been expedited by three to five years into the future. But despite the recent advancements in digital transformation, manual processes and repetitive tasks are the most inefficient and expensive burden to the bottom line of the contact center. However, with the support of automation, customer-centric contact centers are changing and organizations are using customer care teams and technology, not for necessarily damage control or reducing costs in the contact center, but to improve revenue. In fact, 48% of contact center leaders are stating that they would like to invest more of their department's budget in process automation and optimization. Again, aimed at not just at reducing costs, but improving areas such as employee engagement, customer satisfaction, customer retention, and of course, as I mentioned, revenue. But before purchasing a new technology for your company to automate key processes, the right question to ask is, what exactly can the ROI look like and how can it be achieved for your contact center? I'm Matt Wujak, CCW Digital Market Research Analyst, and I wanna welcome you to the next session, the ROI of support automation. And I'm joined by an extremely incredible speaker today in Tim Yeadon, the Chief Revenue Officer at Capacity, an enterprise artificial intelligence sales as a service company focused on helping teams simply do their best work. Capacity is the world's first AI powered support automation platform that contains everything you need to automate key processes and unlock your company's ability to do its best work. <clears throat> Tim has spent about 20 plus years working for tech companies in a variety of roles spanning sales, marketing, client success, and delivery and consulting. These roles have pro provided the opportunity to work with a diverse set of organizations from high growth startups to large scale enterprises. I'm thrilled to welcome Tim to today's session and our online event. Tim, how are you today? Matt, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Excited for the conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you as well. So to kick things off, I want to dive in. Being a market research analyst myself, I want to dive into some of the market trends and hear your opinion on automation, obviously. So what are the key market trends driving the need for things like support automation in customer service and the contact center? Well, I, I think you covered it pretty well in your intro, you know, for the two decades plus I've spent in the industry, there has always been the view that call centers, contact centers are a cost center, right? Um, maybe in some cases a necessary evil, but a place that um, is looked at more in terms of profit and loss than, than pure investment. We've seen a real shift uh, the last year plus uh, with the pandemic and some of the trends coming out of the pandemic. And so if you look at something as straightforward as wages, right, for, for staff in the contact center. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in May, going back to May 2020, depending on the industry you're in, you were probably paying your call center agent somewhere between 32,000 and 43,000 a year, right? We're seeing that now post-pandemic be upwards of 10 to 20% of an increase. And we're also seeing people who were laid off from these positions not coming back to these roles, not coming back to the companies. And so you have the associated training costs going up as well uh, by bringing in a whole new generation of folks to work in our contact centers. And so we're just seeing some really interesting trends in the labor market the last nine to 12 months that are really exacerbating the need and the cost dynamics around staffing a call center. That's probably the biggest trend that we're hearing from our customers and that we're just seeing in the market at large. That's a great answer. And I think you mentioned the 10 to 20% increase in wages for contact center and employees. And I think part of the reason for that really is more companies are adopting more technologies like AI and automation that, or even self-service that are kind of handling some of the more mundane tasks, which in turn are making the role of the contact center agent more specialized, where they're focusing more on personalized interactions and really delivering other soft skills or emotional intelligence and empathy and being able to relate to customers and solve more complex problems. 
And as I mentioned, digital transformation has been expedited, as you mentioned as well, in the past year and a half. But obviously, some of the technologies we mentioned are better than others. What should companies really look for in automation or support automation platforms moving forward? Yeah, first of all, I think it needs to fit your overall corporate strategy and what you're trying to do for your brand, right? All industries are going to be a little bit different. Um, I think for too long, technology and automation have been seen as potentially the enemy of good customer service. And I think we really need to view it as complementary or supplementary um, in terms of our customer service strategies. And so the first thing I think any leader needs to do is sit back and say, what are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to do for our customers, maybe for our prospects, prospective customers along with that? And just always think about what you're trying to represent through, through your brand, okay? And then when you look at the technologies available out there, we kind of call this field generally support automation. That's really an umbrella category made up of several categories of software. So this is your help desk, this is your contact center software, um, RPA, robotic process automation fits, fits in here, self-service tools uh, like knowledge bases fit in here, chatbots are obviously big in the market. There are a number of different technologies that obviously fit, fit into this, this overall support automation landscape. And so I think, again, going back to not only the brand strategy, but also the technology strategy and planning a roadmap is really important because if you piecemeal these technologies together, if you do it in a reactive nature and you just adopt kind of as you feel the need arise instead of proactively defining a roadmap, you're gonna overpay, you're gonna run into collisions, you're gonna have a really hard time coming up with a justifiable ROI. So what we see and, and what we think any platform should be is one, it should be very intuitive, very easy to use. Two, it should be fast, it should be efficient for your customers and your end users. No one likes to wait. And so anything you look at should prioritize speed, expediency of the, of the experience. And then three, we think platforms need to be generative, meaning you should be able to deploy addition solutions over time on these platforms. So said differently, if you cobble together a bunch of point solutions, you're gonna have a hard time getting the same ROI as if you go with a platform that is more generative in nature and allows you to build more solutions because then it becomes a case in the point solution world of having to constantly go find the vendor or the subcategory of technology that meets the need versus having a platform that you can continuously evolve from and on top of. Absolutely, and having a platform that is able to kind of use artificial intelligence to learn over time and obviously get better over time. And you brought up a number of great points there, and I like that you brought up specifically speed and efficiency. And that's actually the top two consumer preferences that customers judge customer service on. And we kind of touched on it a little, a little bit already, but speaking of the goals of support automation, whether it's operational efficiency or managing customer inquiries and high volume or letting agents spend time on, like I said before, intellectually stimulating conversations instead of mundane tasks, or even simply improving things like customer satisfaction. What are some of the other goals of support automation? Yeah, I, I think the first goal really should be what work is repetitive that we can deflect and automate, right? I think that is where we actually see um, the greatest return on investment. You know, we have questions, the same question we answer over and over and over again. We have the same processes that we execute over and over and over again. You mentioned AI. Those are the best use cases for artificial intelligence, um, repeatable use cases. And so those come up all the time in the contact center. So what work can we deflect, what tasks, repetitive tasks can we automate and therefore what bottlenecks can we remove both from our teams and for our customers to provide that more expedient, efficient process. Um, as, as we really look across where organizations are having success with automation, that's the focus. The focus isn't on inventing some new way to serve our customers. It's in finding the ways to just serve our customers better through efficiency and, uh, and automation and, and better speed through these repetitive tasks that they're doing all the time. Because the customer wants a fast experience just as much as our team members want to offload that repetitive work. 
Absolutely. And then, of course, there's the cost piece of kind of having the capabilities of some of the benefits that you talked about. What are some of the primary cost categories that brands and end users should really be considering when they're evaluating some of these new capabilities or new umbrella of software to consider, especially with artificial intelligence? Yeah, sure. So, so um, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to uh, fin financial executives and, and what I always like to say is there's a lot of ways to look at ROI, but I, I think there's four common categories on the cost side of the equation that we need to make sure we're, we're accounting for. And we need to do this very early in our process when we're looking to acquire or even renew existing uh, technology contracts. So the first is, of course, simply the licensing costs, right? Um, how much is the software going to cost us to license? What are the licensing models? Is it consumption-based? Is it based on number of agents? If it's based on number of agents and you are considering growing your number of agents exponentially, you can expect your licensing costs to go up. So understanding the costs and the model of licensing. Next is your implementation costs. So if you're bringing in a new technology, what's it going to cost to get it implemented off the ground? Um, and what, what skills and resources are we going to need to do that? What's the pull on my current team to implement this, this new software or this new technology? Kind of the next category is then what are the ongoing management and support costs? So once we're implemented, once we're up and running, and by the way, we should understand how long that's going to take, right? What are the realistic expectations for the software being in place and our agents utilizing it? What's it look like for us to continue to support that software? Is it cloud-based? Is it on-premise? What infrastructure um, uh, investments are required if it is on-premise? Understanding those support costs are really important. And probably the most thing we need, important thing we need to understand is what skill sets do we need to have on, on staff to continue to su support it? Do we need to bring new people on staff to support the technology? And then the last one is everything around change management. It's, it's training. Um, it's the loss of productivity when people are learning a new system. Are we asking them to run a legacy system and new system in parallel for a little while? We like to call that the swivel chair. All these are areas that we need to understand as well. Just what's the real impact on our people um, by bringing in a new investment like that? So we had licensing costs, implementation costs, support costs, and then just every, anything related to the organizational change management piece. Absolutely. And I love that you talked a good deal about implementation. What would you say are some of the primary gain categories in terms of implementation and implementing a new software in the contact center? Yeah. So, so when we look at gain, um, there, there's a few, few again, categories, just like there were on the, on the cost side. So one, we probably are replacing some other system we're using today in mo most cases. Um, I think most call centers, most contact centers are using a number of different applications to support their customers. And so, uh, you know, we need to look at what apps, what technology we, we can retire uh, as, as part of this. Um, we then have, uh, where can we make up for labor savings? So one thing we see out there is this exponential growth in operational costs related to, to customer support. We talked about it earlier. Um, it feels like every time we add a customer, we feel like we have to add someone to the contact center or uh, every time we want to expand into a new market, add a new service, whatever it might be. So what repetitive work can we offload from our team, therefore, uh, maybe having a, a positive impact on our, on our hiring plans, right? Getting more out of the team we have now, uh, long, longer term, I think is a, is a really key area to identify on the game side. And then we look at things like throughput improvement and experience improvement. If we're able to take a process that involves five people today and completely automate that without involving any people and therefore removing bottlenecks related to workload relating to um, sick time, paid time off, whatever it might be. If we can run that in the background in automated fashion, there's, there's throughput improvement that we can get there. And then there's the experience improvements as well. Customers, you talked about them wanting speed. They wanna self-serve. They wanna be able to support themselves. They wanna do, do it through a number of modalities and channels, whether it's mobile or what have you but they wanna be able to go find those answers themselves. So if we can use automation to provide more of that self-service, put more power in our customers' hands, we start to see things like net promoter scores and customer satisfaction scores uh, start to go up in a positive manner because the experience is fully in their control, which is a huge theme we're seeing across call centers. You mentioned that 
every time we add a new customer, it seems like we have to add a new agent. And I couldn't agree more with that concept. What do you think kind of contributes in terms of automation for really being able to give agents the tools they need to be able to personalize interactions and really focus on what human beings are supposed to be focusing on in their workday as opposed to doing those repetitive or manual tasks that we have the technology and the solutions to really um, kind of make up for instead of using employees or agents or paying agents to do those manual or tedious tasks? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I, I think it goes back to what we talked about before and deflecting as much work as we can from their plates. So they can focus on uh, the more, more complicated or the areas that need that, that attention, that, that human touch, right? Um, so when we think about deflecting work and we think about automating work, it has multiple benefits. Um, the first is it makes everyone's day a little bit more enjoyable because they're actually interacting with customers um, instead of maybe flipping between 20 screens, uh, perhaps they're just on their fifth call in a row asking the same question, um, needing to reset that password, needing to change that reservation, update that reservation, whatever the use case uh, may be. And in some cases, uh, those can be handled by the customer on their own. In some cases, they really do need, need to talk to someone, right? And, and they really do need that personal touch that we just talked about a few minutes ago. So I think that what, what automation does is it really helps us um, do that deflection. And then it also helps us analyze where we have additional opportunities for either automation or where we do need to be escalating to our, to our team members. So by, by uh, putting things in the context of automation, we can apply analytics, we can apply machine learning, um, we can apply artificial intelligence, these concepts you hear about in the marketplace. And what it really allows us to do is look at the data and analyze the data and moving forward in the future, see how can we use the data to really inform the type of customer experience that we want to provide instead of operating on a hunch, maybe on more subjective criteria than objective criteria and, and things of that nature. So we see the benefits across um, um, multiple areas, um, but no doubt that, that, that focus on deflecting the work, deflecting the repetitive tasks. I know I say it over and over. I'm repetitive myself in saying it. Um, that is where we see the gain from both your team members and your customers. The, the data is overwhelmingly positive in that, in that nature. Well, the concept is certainly worth repeating. And I think the data point has never been more important as well. And what we're seeing, in fact, CCW Digital recently conducted a study that asked contact center and customer experience leaders, which departments would they like to be more involved with? And it's interesting because sales, marketing, and operations were actually the three top categories of 11 sections. So speaking of specifically sales and marketing, how can the contact center really be working with other departments across the organization to retain customers and use things like actionable analytics and data to ultimately retain customers and provide the best customer experience moving forward so that, that they're coming back for more and providing more value for the organization? Well, well, now you're getting into an area that I, I, I'm really passionate about. So my responsibilities today span um, at, at our company, um, our sales team, our marketing team, and then, then our support teams. And so um, we see very tight integration and collaboration between those three teams, of course, along with our product and engineering teams as the absolute key to not only retaining customers, but turning them into net promoters and expanding our customer relationships. So the way uh, we almost look at it in a hub and spoke manner where our customer support group, right? Our version of the contact center is the hub, which all those other groups uh, kind of plug into uh, for information because they represent the voice of the customer. And for us as a, as a company, you mentioned it before, our mission is to help teams do their best work, right? And so when I think about that, we need to hear from those teams to make sure we're constantly evolving our product offerings so we can help them do their best work. And that comes in through our customer support, through our, our, our call center, right? That's, that's where we get this information. And then that's how we um, really uh, inform and educate our sales and marketing teams because we don't wanna be um, messaging capabilities that don't matter um, or that are inefficient or ineffective for our customers. We don't wanna be selling capabilities that aren't gonna have a good ROI for our customers. And by the way, our prospective customers want to know from sales, what ROI can I expect? 
Help me build the business case. How can I do that? And we want to do that within the context of current customers, not just made up facts and figures or, or hunches. We want our current customers really driving that ROI equation to our prospective uh, clients. And so that's how we really um, kind of view our own internal operations. And, and I, I, it's really made a huge impact for us. And I can't encourage you know, listeners of this more that getting your call center folks together with your, um, your sales and your marketing teams, really uh, uh, coming up with a cross-team, cross-functional focus group. Uh, so you have that voice of the customer and everything you're doing from a sales and marketing perspective. That contact center is, is really the key to unlocking the value there. I couldn't agree more. And not enough organizations are using the contact center to capitalize on things like customer retention and customer lifetime value, especially since retaining a customer and um, doing business with a previous customer is exponentially more profitable than spending, spending dollars or marketing budgets on finding, trying to find new potential customers or um, finding customers or ways to incorporate data and new products and things that are already existing and have the information to do in the contact center. And you mentioned the ROI piece quite a bit. What are some of the ways to calculate the ROI of support automation? So I, I think the, the most important thing we have, to, we have to understand to get a really good ROI calculation is, do we really understand how much it costs uh, to, to provide support today to, to our customers? So if we take a step back and say, what are all the channels of support we offer, okay? So uh, do we obviously offer probably phone support. Um, maybe we offer some form of live chat support. Uh, maybe there's email in. Maybe we do offer a knowledge center with some self-service tools, right? And then are we measuring the volume of inquiries and requests we're getting through each, each of those? And then our resolution rates for each of those? and then our labor distribution across each of those channels. In larger organizations, there are, are teams dedicated to just doing live chat. There are teams dedicated to just doing phone. There are teams dedicated to just doing email, right? Do we really understand the cost per channel? If you look at industry metrics, generally speaking, again, it will vary by industry, it will uh, vary by company size. It's about 18 bucks per phone call into a contact center. Goes down slightly for email to about 15. It goes down slightly again for live chat to about to about 12. Okay, um, we see cases in, in the support automation world where you can get that down well under a dollar. You can get that down to to pennies on the dollar based on the volumes you're you're able to handle. But you can't really you can't really calculate your ROI without understanding what are my what are my channels, what are my volumes per channel, what's my cost per channel, and then what can I reasonably expect to hand off or to shift to self-service support automation. You can be very conservative and say, maybe 20% of our inquiries and requests. Um, I would say you could get as aggressive as 50, 60, 70%. But if we understand that over time and make some assumptions over time how to do that, um, over a one year, two year, three year basis, we can really understand how the ROI starts to, to, to multiply. You mentioned artificial intelligence before. That is so important to any modern support automation strategy, and here's why. AI running in the background is constantly looking at everything, all those interactions that are happening between your agents and your customers. And it's analyzing and it's uh, offering up recommendations and ideas for what repetitive tasks, what questions it can start to take over for self-service. And what you see with machines is the learning curve, the utility, grows exponentially through usage, right? So while it takes a little while to build, there's no magic button here, there's no easy button, this just, you don't turn on day one and it's working and deflecting 50% of what you want to do. But over time, six months, eight months, 12 months, you start to see this curve get steeper and steeper and steeper where the automation can take on a lot more and the ROI calculation gets more and more attractive over time. So really understanding those categories and what you feel like you can deflect through self-service is, is really that key to, to, to calculating that ROI. The concept of machine learning, learning exponentially over time and also delivering exponential more um, revenue or profits for the contact center is an extremely interesting and kind of futuristic concept that um, I think a lot of organizations should be looking more into. 
since the investment is getting better and better with an exponential rate. But of course, I mentioned earlier that a lot of digital transformation initiatives um, fail, even though there's more options out there, um, especially now where there's a lot of interesting concepts and people are becoming more of aware of certain, certain technologies like automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning. But a lot of solution providers don't necessarily have the proof behind the pudding. What pitfalls should companies really avoid when they're looking into investing into automation support or perhaps looking into um, finding new solution providers? Yeah, so have a plan, right? I think it, it gets a little uh, tired and everyone uh, kind of assumes, yes, we'll, we'll have a plan, we'll have a strategy. But when you really think about that plan and strategy, it goes back to what we talked about before cross-functional teams, putting that plan and strategy together, I think are, are really important, right? And so having a plan going in, identifying the tools and technology you use today to support your customers, um, and then uh, directionally what you want to do with your brands, how much of your support do you want to be human-centered versus automated, and do you have a customer base? Do you serve demographics that are a good use case for automation and self-service. Not all demographics are great and industries are, are good use cases for this. If, you're in, uh, if you sell extremely technical products, uh, maybe in industrial manufacturing, um, that's probably gonna require a high level of consulting between someone in a contact center and a customer on the other line to troubleshoot a problem. I'm not saying there's a zero ROI on that, but I'm saying it's gonna be different from other, from other industries. So really think about what is possible Put that cross-functional team together, uh, bring those minds to the table, sales and marketing with your contact center, with your engineering folks, if they exist in your organization, um, and really think about what it is we want to do. And then go through the hard work of making sure you have good benchmark metrics. Make sure you're measuring how you're doing things before you go pursue this strategy so you can compare the benchmark, understand your costs, your volumes, your channels, the things we just talked about. Um, and then really put all that together. And then you have to meet to review it. I think quarterly, some would say uh, every six months, but bringing that cross-functional team together uh, quarterly is really important. And the last thing I'll say is you really need um, one person. I, I believe you need one person who's signing up for leading the initiative, um, being the center point for communication, being the center point for gathering the metrics, leading these quarterly sessions and so forth. I think it's really important that this is someone's full-time job in the organization, um, not 10% you know, of 10 people's jobs. It's 100% of um, one people's role. The probably the main thing we see is people just don't dedicate. It doesn't take a lot of resources. It just takes focus. And they just don't take the time to dedicate someone to have the focus on a program like this. Extremely well said. And I have one more question, Tim. Is there anything that say certain contact center leaders or even managers might be able to do to gain executive buy-in to tap into some of the benefits and um, objectives that we learned so, um, so that one person can really lead that initiative over time after gaining executive buy-in? Well, from my perspective, um, I, I would say to all the contact center leaders um, who, who are attending this event, um, one, you, you are in, I think most ways, if not always, the front door to the company, you're the biggest brand ambassador. Um, and so your, your position in the company is just so, so critical. And it's not about being a cost center, it's about being a value creator. Um, and so with the amount of data and interactions with your customers, um, as we've talked about, you uh, represent a lot of value to your sales and marketing counterparts. Um, driving the strategy around technology and how you can not only retain your current talent, but provide that better, more efficient, faster experience to your customers while providing better economics back to the company. I mean, that's a win, 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 win right there. And so I would say think across those categories as you do go to your executive peers and other executive leaders, think about it in those terms and uh, delivering a strategies with those key pillars. And I think you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find great benefits from it. Absolutely. I want to thank Tim and the entire capacity team for providing us with some great tips and customer experience insights around the ROI of automation and how it can really enhance the contact center and productivity of the customer experience department. 
For those of you still listening, make sure to stay tuned for our next session of Modernizing Service Experiences with AI and Digital immediately following this one in about a couple of minutes, and we'll see you there. Thank you for listening.